the names in your agenda and the faces on the podium that we have prepared a, a tremendous uh, flourish to conclude this uh, Global Strategic Review. In the last session, there was uh, some debate near the end as to whether the, the world in the next 10 years would resemble the pre-9-11 world or would take a new post-9-11 shape, whether we would be back to the future or whether the future would go more forward towards the past. In a way, this session is intended to, to grapple those, with those issues uh, from a, a variety of uh, different uh, perspectives. We have entitled the session, uh, 10 Years On, Terror, War, and Strategy. And our great friend, Carl Bildt, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden, will uh, take a, a broad view of the, the challenges uh, invoked by the memory and the fact of 9-11. Uh, uh, Nigel Inkster, our Director of Transnational Threats and Political uh, Risk, uh, engaging in his fourth uh, uh, performance at this uh, uh, GSR, will speak specifically about the relationship between intelligence and uh, strategy. And our loyal council member, Dr. Elliot Cohen, will fulfill the academic role of answering the question precisely and say a few words on terror, a few words on war, and a few words on strategy. And then we'll have a wonderful debate uh, before the envoy from our chairman, Francois Edward. So, Corbett. Or, yes, thanks very much. I think we um, all more or less remember where we were on that uh, very day, 9-11. I happened to be on Potsdamer Platz in Berlin, showing a friend where the wall had been slightly more than 10 years ago. And then, suddenly, in a moment, the word changed again. November the 9th, 12 years earlier, a European 9-11 meant the end of the Cold War. And the new 9-11 that happened then meant the end of the post-war world. We went, perhaps, from the uh, word of Henry Kissinger to perhaps the challenges of Samuel Huntington. The United States reacted with understandable fury. It immediately divided the world into those that were with it and those who were against. There was nothing in between. And of course, we were with the United States. In sympathy and in solidarity, we were all Americans during those very days. Immediately, and with the clear authority of the UN Security Council, it became a necessity to force a change of a regime in Afghanistan that harbored the nucleus of the global terrorist threat. But as we were to learn in Iraq somewhat later, Regime destruction is a fairly simple kinetic enterprise, but regime construction is a vastly more elaborate, complex, and time-consuming undertaking. And we are still there in Afghanistan with more than 140,000 international forces, and with a situation, as we discussed yesterday evening, that has become more and more difficult as the years have passed by. Thereafter, as we remember, the United States and some of its allies felt the necessity of achieving kinetic regime destruction also in Iraq. There are very few indeed, I doubt any, that would regret the demise of Saddam's regime and his thoroughly brutal regime. But this was a war of choice rather than a war of necessity to take a phrase from the US debate. And it came to consume resources and attention much beyond what I think anyone had really anticipated when the decision was taken. From the wider geopolitical point of view, I think the jury is still out. The one country that distinctly benefited from it in strategic terms was Iran. 9-11 also, of course, meant a global surge, a huge global surge in security operations and security cooperation. And most of this was, of course, very much for the better. 
We averted numerous deadly attacks across the world in the years that followed. But we sometimes also paid a fairly heavy political price in terms of political credibility. When human rights and the rule of law was set aside, I don't need to mention the names, or when there was a perception of that being the case. It took some time for us all to find the right balance between the urgent demand for security against the new threat and the values that are so cherished in our societies. I hope that we've found that balance by now. In a purely tactical sense, to speak in war terms, there is no doubt that 9-11, the attack, was a huge success for Al-Qaeda. This was truly a surprise attack. This was truly asymmetrical warfare at its best from that point of view. And the symbolism was, of course, great. It was the very symbols of American financial and military might that was subject to this sudden and completely unexpected attack. But from a strategic perspective, a decade later, it must be seen as a rather miserable failure. It did not, in any systematic way, endanger the systems and the structures that he tried to attack. Globalization, the megatrend of our age, just forged ahead. And as an immediate reaction, the power of the United States across the world surged. And from there, as we know now, it was downhill for Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, slowly, but certainly we know it by now. But if then the network crumbled, the methods, unfortunately, became established. Terror established itself, perhaps primarily in South Asia and the Middle East, but also elsewhere, as part of our modern world. It became part of what we might call the new normal. Hardly a day nowadays goes by without news of a grueling attack in one of the fracture zones or fragile areas of our world. This morning, four persons were arrested on suspicion of planning a terrorist act in Gothenburg in Sweden. And as usual, we had news of attacks in Afghanistan. But horrible as this is, it has not changed the world, not changed the world as such in the way that many feared and some obviously hoped. We live with the new normal. Seen from my obviously somewhat European perspective, 9-11 accelerated our shift of focus from dealing primarily with the ex-Soviet world of the East, still very important, I'm heading to Ukraine in the next few days, to our relationship with the big Muslim world in the South. Because the billion-strong wider Muslim world is our closest neighbor, not only on the big maps, on the walls that we see, but of course increasingly across the street back home in our respective cities. And we must find a way of living together, of forging a deeper understanding, of truly working together on the issues of the world. We have no oceans to retreat behind. Living also with Islam is part of our European future. But I would argue that the past decade has turned out to be much better than most fear. The Arab Spring brings hope of a truly new relationship with that important part of the Muslim world in the decades ahead. We saw the rising generations of the Arab world demanding dignity and democracy, not new terror or old caliphates. But the challenge ahead in these areas is, of course, momentous. We saw a revolution of rising expectations. But if there is not representative governments and increasing prosperity in the decade ahead, there will be the risk of a revolution of failed expectations. IMF says that there must be an increase in the growth rates of these countries of approximately 50% if they should be prevent the already staggering high unemployment from rising further. And at the moment, things are heading in the opposite direction. 
We have a profound strategic interest, as has been underlined these days, in helping all the countries of our world, meeting the political, economic and social challenges ahead. If that fails, no barriers will be high enough to isolate us from the consequences. Today, Russia is the most populous of the neighbours of the European Union. But in some decades, its position will be taken by Egypt, which is not a country of 11 time zones, but a river running through a desert. And by then, the population of Pakistan, that country that increasingly is the focus of our attention and our concern, that will be twice as large as that, as that of Egypt, and more than twice as large as it is today. What can we do? To put it very simple, we must continue to make the world safe for globalization. There's simply no other way in which these challenges can be met. To foster economic and social programs in all these areas, to gradually build bridges of cooperation and reconciliation and understanding. If this process were to stop or start going backward, we will in all probability be heading for strife and war as economies stagnate, despair builds up and peoples are turned against each other. But globalization and modernization, as we know, also puts our societies under strain. Karl Popper wrote about the strain of civilization. Thus, this is, I think, the key challenge we are confronted with everywhere. The world has certainly changed in a dramatic way during this decade. But uh, particularly these days, you might ask whether September 2008 has not had more profound effect than September 2001. Announcing before the summer the troop production from Afghanistan, President Obama said it was now time for nation building in America rather than in Afghanistan, or rather, to put it more exactly, depth reduction in America. It's a very changed world that we are living in. In 2001, Sweden exported more than four times as much to the United States as we did to what is today referred to as the BRIC countries. Today, we export more to the BRIC countries than we do to the United States. Someone wrote that the three most important words during the last decade perhaps weren't war on terror, but instead made in China history will tell. But as we move on, we must not forget some of the key lessons of 9-11. I think we have learned them in terms of international cooperation to fight terror. But as the pendulum obviously starts swinging towards nation building or deficit reduction back home, we should remember that we live in a world in which developments in the remotest corners can and will affect us directly. We live in a world where there can be no faraway places of which we know very little and where we don't care. The question is not why we were forced to invade Afghanistan then and all the challenges there since then. The real question is why didn't we care about Afghanistan before? Prevention is often a nice slogan. We must try to put it from a nice slogan to real practical policy. And we can't descend into just building barriers and sending drones to deal with what's beyond them. Globalization has, in my opinion, continued to transform the world for the better. Poverty has been radically reduced in key parts of the world. A new global middle class is emerging from Sao Paulo to Shanghai. Technology is bringing new tools to building a better future. 5.2 billion mobile telephone connections are there in the world today. Then few people have that possibility. Bin Laden, in the attack on 9-11, was against all of this. He wanted to stop and reverse that process of globalization. But at the end of the day, as we look back, he was defeated less by the hard powers of kinetic action than by the soft powers throughout the world 
of continued globalization. Thanks. Carl, thank you very much. <laughs> Nigel Inkster. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the intelligence dimension of this. And I should emphasize at the outset that when it comes to discussing the intelligence dimension of events that uh, are still so close to us, I think it's still far too early for there to be one single version of events. Before coming here, I listened to the first of three reef lectures delivered by Dame Eliza Manning and Buller, the former Deputy, De Deputy um, the former Director General sorry, of the British Security Service, a person of whom I have to say I'm a huge fan. And it was therefore all the more surprising to me that as I listened to Eliza speaking, I found myself, if not disagreeing with some of the points that she made, at least thinking that I would have presented these points very differently. And I think the reason for that is notwithstanding the fact that our operational collaboration uh, during and after 9-11 had been very close and intense, it remained the case that we had both been touching different bits of the elephant in the darkened room. After the end of the anti-Soviet jihad, we saw outbreaks of jihadist and transnational terrorist activity at various points around the world. And this very quickly seemed to start to add up to a new intelligence trend. And a small dedicated band of CIA case officers and analysts uh, worked hard to try and monitor all of these activities and pull them all together. But the reality was that right up until 9-11, this phenomenon remained too nebulous and too disaggregated um, to the point where it stubbornly resisted um, aggregation to a stage where it could justify, justify sustained top-level policy attention. And that, I think, was the real difficulty of this. His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Turki bin Faisal, reminded me on Friday evening that in 1995, Hassan Turabi had offered to send Osama bin Laden from Sudan to the United States. The answer that he received in due course was that the United States had no legal basis on which to hold or to prosecute bin Laden. Um, and even if it had been possible for the policy community to achieve strategic notice of the impending threat, as the 9-11 Commission report put it, before the catastrophic scale of the potential threat was manifest, massive action to counter it seemed so disproportionate as to be inconceivable. In essence, George Kennan's dinosaur did not perceive sufficient reason to stir himself from its mud bath. Um, of course, 9-11 changed that. Um, and it should be said that before 9-11, CIA working with my own and other services had begun to get some intelligence traction on the Al-Qaeda leadership in Afghanistan and were starting to build a bit of pic better picture. But as, as is so often the case with counterterrorism, we didn't get there fast enough to stop the big spectacular we'd increasingly come to believe was in the offing. 9-11 was a major shock, and one can't convey the sense of frustration and failure to which it gave rise within the US intelligence community. In America, that community went into a level of overdrive which led us in the UK to fear that they would burn themselves out before they achieved any meaningful results. But once a policy decision had been taken to invade Afghanistan and to, to deprive Al-Qaeda of their safe haven, uh, the intelligence machine kicked into gear and did what it knew best. A small band of CIA and a few SIS case officers helped mobilize and enable a Northern Alliance assault on the Taliban making use of the time-honored Afghan technique of buying the allegiance of those who sat on the fence. Old contacts from the anti-Soviet jihad were resuscitated and sent back to their home regions with money and instructions to make or keep these regions Taliban free. At one point, I feared for the survivability of North London's minicab services as former anti-Soviet mujahideen 
abandoned their newfound vocation and headed back home. But although getting rid of the Taliban proved surprisingly easy after an inevitably somewhat rocky start, we were unable to stop the Al-Qaeda leadership making their way into Pakistan, to tribal areas where they were free to start again. What we found in Afghanistan was a very detailed picture of what Al-Qaeda had been up to at that point, and it was at that stage a fairly structured, bureaucratic operation that kept detailed records. And we were able to obtain from detainees important evidence of evolved terrorist plots, such as that by a Jamaat Islamiyah cell to launch multiple attacks against US and UK targets in Singapore. But it left us, specifically the United States, with a difficult legacy of detainees who didn't fit into any easy legal category and whom it was difficult to know what to do with. And that legacy, of course, lives on in the form of Guantanamo Bay. But of more immediate importance was the fact that in terms of knowing where Al-Qaeda leaders were, what they and their supporters around the world might be doing and planning next, the screen had effectively gone dark. And it was that, at that point that things began to get difficult. Under pressure to get results, the United States government effectively rewrote the rules and, as it seemed to us in London, went off the reservation. There was clearly a fundamental difference of conceptual approach between ourselves and the USA on what this phenomenon was that we were dealing with. Eliza, in her reef lecture, was adamant that 9-11 was a crime and should have been dealt with as a law and order issue. But for the United States, Al-Qaeda was a global insurgency which had declared war on America. The controlling minds behind 9-11 were not justiciable in any conventional sense. And they had to be dealt with, in the first instance, using other than a law enforcement approach. But first they had to be found. And you know, the first break, as we know, came with the capture of Abu Zubaydah inside Pakistan. Abu Zubaydah was a key Al-Qaeda facilitator. He didn't know anything about impending plots, but he did know about something equally, if not more valuable. Who was in the organization, where some of them were, what were the relationships between them, and what were the logistic and financial support networks which sustained them. It only became clear much after the event how this information had been acquired from Abu Zubaydah as part of a suite of techniques adopted by the CIA, which the United States Attorney General deemed legal, but in the eyes of his United Kingdom counterpart was not. Now, international legal opinion unequivocally lies with the UK interpretation, but then there is a thing called American exceptionalism to which we have made frequent reference. I'd like to think that it would have been possible to get the information from people like Abu Zubaydah, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Ramzi bin al Shebe using less coercive techniques, um, and I think that would have been possible. Um, but as the disparity in our approaches became clear, this created significant dilemmas for a UK intelligence community that had long been in the habit of close unquestioning and largely unconditional cooperation with their UK, US counterparts. And these issues have never been entirely resolved, but where cooperation could take place within the law, it did. I'm in no doubt that during this period, the USA took a wrong turn. The CIA in particular should never have become the nation's jailers. And detainee interrogation has never been part of the skill set of a foreign intelligence service, and in my view, never should. But it shouldn't entirely surprise us that all this should have happened if we cleave to the concept of Al-Qaeda as a global insurgency. Because I can think of no insurgency that has ever happened where the government whose authority was challenged did not initially overreact. I think this is to be expected. A better acid test is how quickly it moves from an overreaction to a more balanced and thoughtful approach. And this normally comes when a much better intelligence picture has been established, which in the case of Al-Qaeda took time. I remember a discussion with a senior security service colleague quite late in 2006, where for the first time we were able to agree that even if we couldn't see the opposing riverbank, we at least now had uh, some idea of where it might be. And I think that is an indi indication of the difficulty that uh, we confronted. And it must be emphasized 
that neither my service nor any other non-US service acting alone would have got very far without American assistance. Notwithstanding some of the problems described above, we were part of an informal global coalition of intelligence and security services, ranging from the willing and able to the incompetent and coerced, with the USA holding the reign and acting as CT collector of first resort for the international community. Of the many plots that we and other Western European services disrupted between 2001 and the present, I can't think of a single one that did not benefit from game-changing US intelligence. We can argue endlessly about whether US foreign and security policy actually created for us threats that might otherwise not have existed. I happen to believe that this probably was the case, at least in respect of the Iraq invasion. But when it came to dealing with these threats, there is no doubt in my mind that the United States did more to make Europe safe from terrorism than Europe was willing or able to do for itself. Over the past few months, I've been boring to death large swathes of the world's viewing public and newspaper readership, answering a series of stock questions about 9-11 and its aftermath. The truth is I'd started to bore myself, so God only knows what I was doing to all these other people. I'm not going to work through all these questions, but I'm going to address just two of them that I think are relevant. And the first one is, could we have done more to deal with Al-Qaeda before 9-11? Well, perhaps. But I'm not going to stand, sit here and tell you that if we in the USA had had twice the men and the money that we did pre-9-11, we'd have been able to deal with the problem. For the reasons that I just set out, I don't think that was the way it would have worked. But the reality is that by 2001, both CIA and my own service had suffered a 25% attrition from Cold War levels. And in the case of my own service, it is now clear in retrospect that we came perilously close to falling below critical mass. It's been a besetting sin, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, to invest heavily in intelligence in times of national emergency, and then to disinvest equally heavily the minute we think the coast is clear. And in a world characterized by uncertainty and multiple threats and challenges, I'm not sure that's really such a good idea. And in any case, actually, intelligence spending, in the pure sense of the term, has not been that great. I think I'm right in saying that the US intelligence budget for 2010, the purely civilian evident, uh, element, is, uh, was 52 billion uh, US dollars. I'm not quite sure what percentage of DD, GDP that represents, but it's well below 1% uh, of that, I'm confident. And it doesn't seem to be, to be such a major investment. Where spending has been heavy is actually not in intelligence per se, but rather in what might be termed the Homeland Security Agenda writ large. And this is particularly evident in the United States, where we have seen numerous contractors jumping with alacrity on the latest gravy train to leave Beltway Central Station. Now, some of that expenditure may have proven to be useful. I have a suspicion that quite a lot of it may not have been. And I think we have certainly seen an unnecessary and undesirable securitization of the US bureaucracy. I'm told that 850,000 people in the United States now have top level clearances. Uh, I can't help wondering whether there is really much point in classifying any information that can be known by quite so many people. The other point I would make about intelligence is that although we have in some respects seen a step change in intelligence, particularly technical intelligence, which is almost comparable to the change experienced by General John Pershing when he went from chasing the Apache around the badlands of New Mexico on horseback to directing battles with artillery barrages, armored assaults, and aerial warfare. This has taken place really in two areas. We've seen a massive militarization intelligence, and the military have benefited enormously from the phenomenon of intelligence fusion, which brings together, in close to real time, information from a range of sources into one coherent and inclusive package which can be acted upon. The other area is the field of investigative analysis, combining information from a wide range of databases, video surveillance, mobile phone and email coverage, and so on, to illuminate the activities of an individual or group. And it seems to me now that the big exam question must be how much of these capabilities must we 
uh, and can we transfer across to dealing with the kinds of intelligence problems and challenges that we are going to face in the future. And if you will indulge me a moment, John, I'd just like to say that notwithstanding what I've just said, we must recognize that in the past decade, those of our countries who've been dealing with this problem of transnational terrorism have witnessed the emergence of a remarkable, talented, young generation of case officers, men and women, who have performed with great distinction in some of the most challenging and dangerous operational circumstances that we could ever have imagined. And as is the way in this business, they've done it without any public recognition. Um, as Rudyard Kipling observed in respect of one particular uh, British military foe who he greatly admired, he hasn't got no papers of his own, he hasn't got no medals nor awards. And I think that this might be a good moment to just pause for a second to reflect on the remarkable achievements that this young group of people have uh, brought about and think about how we can you know, harness that for the future. And lastly, because I'm clearly wearing off my welcome here, the other question I keep on being asked is, are we safer as a result of everything that we've done and everything that's happened since 9-11? Well, I think the answer to that may be, if you are a European or an American, yes, in the sense that it is probably now much harder for Al-Qaeda or any other terrorist group to mount the kind of spectacular attack that we witnessed on 9-11. We just know so much more about it, and we're much better defended against the threat. But I think that if I were, let us say, a Pakistani, my reply might be along the lines that for Americans and Europeans to be safe, it seems that an awful lot of Pakistanis have to die. And this goes back to the point I made last night about the jihadist soup to which I referred. That soup is still bubbling on a number of stoves around the world and periodically threatens to boil over. And it seems to me that unless we help, think hard about how we're going to help those in whose kitchens this soup is bubbling, we are never going to be as safe as we would like to be. Thank you. Nigel, thank you very much for dealing not just forensically, but very sensitively and philosophically with a, a difficult issue, Elliot Curran. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be uh, uh, the only American on uh, this panel on uh, this day. Uh, it's also something of a difficulty, and I uh, hope you'll indulge me because uh, I want to share some of the memories that came flooding back uh, as I began drafting remarks uh, for this panel. Uh, the first memory actually is about a week before 9-11. Uh, the family had just returned from a trip to our wonderful uh, western parks, uh, Zion and uh, the Grand Canyon. And I remember my, very vividly my wife saying, boy, this is just wonderful. It can't last. Uh, and that was something we, we recalled later on. Uh, the morning of 9-11, I was working at my home in the Maryland suburbs of uh, Washington, D.C. I got a phone call from my uh, former research assistant who had been working on Wall Street. He said, turn on the television. What are, you, what are you talking about? He said, just turn it on. And uh, turning on the television and seeing the uh, second plane hit the towers. Uh, then, of course, the plane hitting the Pentagon, and my first thought was, how am I going to get my wife out of downtown Washington where, where she was? And was she going to be okay? Uh, several days later, I was uh, because I was serving on the Defense Policy Board at the time, we had a meeting at the Pentagon. Of course, the, uh, the site of the charred corner of the Pentagon and the site of rising smoke was there, but I, I think what I remember most is the smell of that smoke, for some reason, more than the, the, the ruin and the, uh, uh, and the smoke rising. Uh, a little while later, visiting New York and uh, seeing that, that gaping hole in the middle of a, of a city that's uh, very dear to me, as I'm sure it is to, to many people here. 
the, uh, the huge stained flag uh, illuminated at the Pentagon as it was rebuilt 24 hours a day. Because uh, you may remember the uh, commitment was made to rebuild it within a year. And if that meant reopening a quarry in the middle of Indiana uh, in the middle of winter, they did that. Um, and a lot of it was done by uh, immigrants who were new citizens. Uh, and above it all was that, that huge stained flag uh, always kept illuminated. Uh, the debates about the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, which took place in the wake of those events, and which in a small way I, I took part in. Um, the former students and uh, friends and family members who went off to fight in those wars, uh, and then of course uh, the thankfully small number of them who, who did not come back. So I, I mention all that uh, not because I'm asking for your sympathy, because I'm not, and I don't actually want it. Uh, but because I think these personal reflections shape my first observation, which is that it is much too early for us to assess this last decade with any real scholarly or analytic detachment. Uh, I am by temperament and increasingly by profession an historian, no longer a political scientist. And I think I, increasingly I've come to understand the limitations on our ability to a, a cool evaluation of events that are this close to us, not just because of the limitations on what we know, and there are still very large limitations on what we know, but because of the power of our, our emotions and our emotional responses to events, particularly events as intense as war, to distort them and to distort our judgments. So with that caution, uh, let me do uh, the opposite of what my friend Aaron Friedberg said academics like to do, which is to make the, to beg the question and try to make it more complex. Uh, I am, as uh, John Chipman said, going to really try to make some very literalist, literal minded kinds of comments about the, uh, the title of this panel, uh, Terror, War, and Strategy. And I, and I have to say, in much of what I'm going to say, much of what I think, uh, I very much share the views of uh, uh, Foreign Minister Bill and uh, Nigel Linkster uh, gave wonderful presentations. So let's start about terror with uh, terror. It seems to me the discourse about terror, uh, very quickly after 9-11 and ever since, has become a discourse about terrorists. That is to say, people who use calculated atrocities directed against civilians to achieve their aims. But most public and indeed most private discussion of terror involves a great deal of tiptoeing around something different, which is the question of purpose and ideology. Terror has often been discussed in this last decade as if it were a plague to be prevented or eradicated, or a cosmic punishment for social or political misdeeds, or the predictable consequence of, and you can take your pick, poverty or imperialism or modernity itself. The upshot, at least in my country, is that political leaders going back to President Clinton through President Bush and now President Obama have talked about the likes of Osama bin Laden with rather less subtlety than the children's author J.K. Rowling has portrayed Lord Voldemort or before her J.R.R. Tolkien described Sauron. For obvious and in some respects uh, quite commendable reasons, political leaders and strategic analysts have described the ideology of Al-Qaeda and other radical Islamist groups, either not at all, which is the usual response, or only and dismissively as an insane perversion of religious faith. Now, that is a prudent point of view, and it's certainly a comfortable point of view, particularly for, le particularly for leaders of diverse societies. <coughs> and perhaps particularly so for secular policy professionals and experts who cannot empathize with religious extremists or perhaps simply are too squeamish to talk about them. But I must say I wonder whether it is an accurate point of view. My own view, and I speak as someone of faith, is that all of the great religious faiths, all of them, have within them entirely authentic strains of fanaticism, and that our largely secular elites disregard those strains at their peril. 
if I read the newspapers right, and if I listen to uh, colleagues currently serving in the Obama administration, Al-Qaeda, as it existed on 9-11, has been pummeled and battered up to the point of disintegration. Certainly that has been the message that increasingly comes out of the administration. But has the age of religious terror really passed? Can we be quite sure that the demons of religiously motivated violence will go quietly back into the shadows where for Westerners at any rate they were consigned sometime in the 17th century? I don't know. But in my heart, I doubt it. And I think we pay a penalty, and we will pay a penalty, as the poet James Russell Lowell once said, for shrinking from the thoughts we needs must think. War. How we choose to describe the conflicts the world has seen since 9-11 is an issue related to this matter of things we are unwilling to say publicly. And, and Nigel Inkster, in many ways, said uh, some of the things I would like to say, but I want to push it a little bit further. Was it wise to talk about a war on terror? Some, not just Liza uh, Manning and Buller, but most notably our own uh, quite justly revered Sir Michael Howard, have marshaled formidable arguments against calling it a war at all. And uh, Sir Michael was, was very clear and very eloquent on this subject. After all, does a war on terror in 2001 or 2011 make any more sense than if the United States had declared a war on dive bombers after Pearl Harbor? in 1941. More to the point, how can one talk about waging war against a disparate, globalized terrorist group? Didn't we run the risk, which again Nigel talked about, about militarizing a conflict best handled by police and intelligence organizations? And there's a great deal of force in these arguments. They remain, however, I think, unconvincing. As in the case of the ideology behind Al-Qaeda, it is too easy on prudential grounds to shrink from calling a thing by its name. It seems to me we have been engaged in war. Now why? Because we've been up against an organized opponent, an intelligent, adaptive, determined, courageous opponent, motivated not by insanity, not by lust, not by greed, not even simply by sadism, although all of those things may be present, but by recognizably political, if to our minds, wildly unrealistic political objectives. And also because we are willing to do all kinds of things, think of those mysterious explosions in the federally administered tribal areas or in Yemen, so often attributed to American drones, that one associates with war. After all, if this isn't war, then the Navy SEAL who put two bullets into Osama bin Laden was a member of a death squad rather than a military formation. But this is a peculiar war. It is a protracted, extensive, uncertain in its beginnings and in its endings, drawing on multiple forms of power, both hard and soft, with many and at sometimes ambiguous combatants. And I think one of the challenges for the Institute and uh, those who take part in its deliberations is to characterize the change in the nature of war. Even now, 10 years after 9-11, it seems to me there is a desperate need for some conceptual clarity and understanding it to include developing the legal framework that should guide and restrain it. And here I don't think that actually we've, uh, we've arrived at a happy place. Um, and I would just say parenthetically, my, my strong feeling is the United States government prefers to kill terrorists because it is still not certain what it would do with them if it captured them. And that's partly because of an ambiguous legal framework. Strategy. Finally, when the wars of 9-11 uh, broke out, the ongoing debate had been about the revolution in military affairs, a transformation of conventional forms of warfare. Now, in some ways, as we've uh, heard earlier on in this uh, uh, global strategy review, there were, that transformation has continued, at least with respect to Asian security issues. But many analysts thought that the wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq were essentially old-fashioned conflicts where none of this applied. The kinds of wars of captains and sergeants uh, that are waged in a way that Abdel Qader or Rudyard Kipling would have understood perfectly well. That's not entirely true. The tools of strategy have been transformed by these conflicts in ways that analysts of military affairs must study. Let me just give you a few examples. 
the globalization of conflict through the internet, whether it's film clips of attacks on YouTube, radical chat rooms, or cyber attack. The development of truly extraordinary organizations capable of locating, tracking, and killing individuals throughout vast areas. The application of many forms of data gathering and analysis from ge geographical information systems to exotic forms of technical intelligence to biometrics. The development, if you will, of micro-military technologies from miniature UAVs to squad radios to precision aiming devices for the smallest weapons, all kinds of sensors, and so on. Now, none of these advances in the art of war, if you will, have had predetermined outcomes, but that's nothing new. The invention of the airplane and the tank did not predetermine the winners of the world wars. But they have changed the way that military organizations, and not just military organizations, wage wars. And it should be noted that on the balance, these inventions, including the organizational innovations that led to the final uh, death of Osama bin Laden, have come from Western militaries. Periodically, some of my fellow professors inform the world that the age of war is over. Uh, and perhaps this time they will be right. But so far, they have always been wrong. War, however, as Clausewitz told us nearly two centuries ago, is a chameleon, shifting its appearance and even its shape, but still remaining war. Finally, for many of us, the, the last decade has simply been a tragedy and many think an avoidable tragedy, or at least one made much worse by poor decisions by foolish or hubristic political leaders. It is very difficult to judge those decisions dispassionately. We still know too little about the outcomes, and most of those who took part in them or who struggled against them are too defensive or too angry to be detached about it. I think it will, for example, take a good generation to come to some kind of dispassionate view of the Iraq war. Beyond this, however, it seems to me that this view of the past decade simply as tragedy is incorrect because it is both insufficiently and excessively dark. Insufficiently dark because it assumes that human beings can make much wiser and more foresighted choices under stress than is probably the case. But also excessively dark. And here I very much would associate myself with uh, some of the previous speaker's remarks. At the end of a decade, the Western powers are weaker economically and politically than they were at the beginning, but I don't think that's because of the wars of 9-11. They remain recognizably free and, measured in absolute terms, strong, in charge of their own destinies, and, relatively speaking, secure. The perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks are, for the most part, in prison or dead, to include the genius, and I think he was a genius, Osama bin Laden. And perhaps most of all, the winds of change are blowing through the part of the world that gave birth to Al-Qaeda. Now, whether the transformations of various societies, but particularly those of the Middle East, will finally eliminate the menace of Islamist terror groups like Al-Qaeda, I cannot tell. But the very fact that 10 years after, 9, after the 9-11 attacks, I would say most of the regimes, which in various ways created the breeding grounds for Al-Qaeda, have fallen or are falling is, I think, some reason for optimism, at least in the very long term. And if 9-11 marked what Churchill once referred to in a very different context as a climacteric in this long war, I suspect that 20 or 30 years from now, we will see the Arab Spring as representing another. Uh, and if that is indeed turns out to be the case, I think it will be seen as a fairly promising sign. Goodness me, thank you very much. We've had a, a wonderful display of uh, philosophy, analysis, understanding, historical perspective, uh, and original thinking. And I would invite, in that same spirit, uh, three or four comments from the floor before we come back to the panel. Jean-Claude Manet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Uh, I would like to, to echo uh, what Nigel uh, Engstel said, and also our friend Cohen, uh, about sometimes the ups and downs of our investments uh, in security and intelligence. Uh, and uh, I very much share his fear that sometimes just after uh, conflicts or after the eruption of uh, um, 
a threat, uh, we devote a lot of uh, attention and resources, and then there is sort of a collapse. And my fear is that after the death of bin Laden, and as we say, we're going from a decade to another decade, um, we would have a, a reduction in our efforts, in particular in the uh, effort necessary in the field of uh, prevention, intelligence, anticipation. And my question really is, uh, where are we today and wh what is your assessment in as far as the risks of unconventional attacks uh, by terror groups is concerned? Uh, we have been concentrating a lot in the past de uh, decade on possibilities that because of the global reach goal of Al-Qaeda, uh, there would be attacks of a magnitude uh, that Francois Heisberg in a book called Hyperterrorism, which would be in itself a challenge you know, to the Western world in particular, but also in, in other uh, parts of the world. So my question really is, what is our assessment today of the probability uh, or what are also the hints that we have that possible WMD devices could be used by terror groups as we see a possible collapse of generally, I mean globally organized networks and more national approaches possibly developing. Uh, is it going to be a threat to be taken into account or is it going to be reduced and uh, what do we do in the face of these evolutions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the last two days, we have been listening to speeches about problems and conflicts in the world. But it seems to me none of the speakers has come up with solutions. So my question is, how would you address the plight of the dispossessed ethnic minorities, we call them in the UK domestic constituents, the disenchanted and the dissidents? Thank you. Ben Barry. I think there's a strategic lesson of the last 10 years, um, which may be a blinding glimpse of the obvious, but it's that doing strategy is very difficult, and it requires from politicians and senior officers and officials the highest standards of leadership, management, decision making, and getting things done. And I think the evidence in the public domain about the UK and the US approach to this, for example, the Iraq war, is that quite often, um, action in Washington and London fell far, fell far short of this. There are notable exceptions, such as President Bush's decision against much advice to surge, and um, other improvements made by the British government late in the day. But I hope that it shows as a salutary reminder um, that this, this not only isn't easy, but requires a very high level of competence and leadership. Patrick Thiel. Uh, there's one subject which the uh, panel hasn't de dealt with, in my view at least, and my remarks are really to some extent uh, directed at Nigel Insta, but also at all of them, is, is the motives for 9-11. I mean, what made people like Mohammed Atta so angry and so uh, hating America so much they were prepared to sacrifice their lives? I mean, we, I mean I've, I, a number of suggestions we made, of course. I mean, the, as you know, the United States mobilized tens of thousands of people to fight the Russians, and then once the Russians had left Afghanistan, they dropped them. Was that one reason? What about the deployment of half a million American troops in Saudi Arabia to expel Saddam from Kuwait, and the punishment of Iraq? Was that a motive? Was it U.S. support for Israel? Was it the militarization of U.S. policy? the military interventions in the Arab and Muslim world. I mean, it's important, I think, to understand the motives of the hijackers, which are essentially political rather than religious, uh, in order, I think, to avoid a similar catastrophe in the future. And it's these motives which have not been properly understood. Yes, on the far right, I couldn't read your name paper. I think it began with P. Yes, you, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, sir. My question goes uh, to the board and to Dr. Cohen in particular. And um, I would li like to know where do you draw the line uh, between terrorism on the one hand 
asymmetric uh, or diasymmetric warfare, on the other hand, and how would you classify the attacks uh, on the uses coal and the Pentagon within this frame? Uh, or are you more inclined to the saying that uh, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter? Thank you. Daniel Fu. Uh, speaking as a lawyer, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to the members of the panel I, actually highlighting that we exist if we conduct this war on terror calling a war in a legal limbo. Uh, now, um, the, I, I'm asking uh, members of the panel um, to take up uh, Elliot Cohen's um, uh, invitation to become historians. We, we know that um, uh, the law of warfare was developed only in the late Northern Renaissance by Grotius. And the Geneva Conventions didn't arise until the 20th century with the horrors of the, the trench warfare. Um, and in terms of prognosis, where do we go from here uh, on conducting war on terror into the 21st century? When do we get some constructive uh, solutions uh, to dealing with how we uh, conduct future wars on terror and terrorists? Aiden Foster Carter. Uh, I would like to share with you briefly, if I may, a surprising lapse of security that occurred within the past 12 hours in this very building. At 1.30, I was about to turn off my light. I moved a pillow and found I was sharing my bed with a cockroach. Um, the surprise factor should not be underestimated. I clearly, someone is at fault in this uh, hotel and I shall find a way to tell them as I'm just telling you. My own security was then at fault because I, I didn't squash the bugger right away. Perhaps I should have done that. There's an analogy there. Uh, I put it in a glass because I wanted to make a suit of it in the morning, a proper judicial process. I should of course have inverted the glass because by the morning, I slept soundly. By the morning, the cockroach was gone. Did I underreact? Had it been a scorpion, I would have obviously not passed a very good night. I would have done something right away. How do we tell the difference in the world that we live in now? And I hope people understand that I'm not trying to make light of any real threat of any kind on this day of all days. But how do we tell the difference between cockroaches, which we can live with, and scorpions, which we can't? And how do we avoid turning the one into the other by, by our own inner misactions? Thank you. Jonathan Pollock, and we'll close with further questions. Jonathan. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I am struck by how much uh, our conceptions of strategy are event-driven, uh, as opposed to other kinds of international phenomena that we did not always understand, except in, in retrospect. Uh, Foreign Minister Bill suggested that Iran was the sole beneficiary of 9-11, I would add another country to that, and that would be China. Uh, that uh, not by design on China's part, to be sure, but certainly the fact that China's sustained um, uh, uh, economic development was done away from being in the strategic headlights of, uh, of uh, uh, global strategy, if you will, begs the issue looking ahead of uh, what would, what would be a clarifying singular event that we might yet face that we can't quite anticipate? Indeed, even as we look to China's emergence, uh, it strikes me that what if the Chinese don't oblige uh, Western strategy uh, by conducting themselves in some context that, uh, that uh, clarifies uh, the longer term? Uh, I say this only because it seems to me that uh, our conceptions of international power have to adapt and adjust uh, to uh, worlds that we uh, may not be comfortable with uh, in terms of our relative power and position. Thank you. Jack, before Fla sorry, Steve Flanagan, who I'd recognize you. Thank you, John. I thought it was worth bringing up one point about the initial U.S. strategy in, in calling it a war on terrorism. What President Bush sought to achieve was the notion that it wasn't either a kinetic military or a law enforcement action, but rather it was a mobilization of total resources within government, financial tracking, law enforcement, intelligence, and the military. Now, to be sure, the, the critique, I think the European critique and others, even the Obama initial critique was that the strategy became imbalanced towards the military and the kinetic, and perhaps the term war gave that impression. But even the Bush administration in its waning, in its waning years realized it had, had to rebalance the toolkit, that it had emphasized too much the kinetic uh, 
and more the ideological and the other dimensions of it. Obama now has also uh, moved away back towards a new strategy and tried to find uh, that rebalancing. But I do think, and this is very much apropos Elliot's comment, I think that what we're still trying to find is how do we measure that strategy and what are the right, what is the right mix of the ideological, the kinetic, the law enforcement dimension in combating this broader struggle, which continues. I think uh, I agree with, with Elliot, sadly, that, that the ideology of whether we defeat Al Qaeda, the ideology of terror, and, and how do you continue to to, uh, to, to beat back the, the franchises, the the uh, the those who embrace the the ideology. Logical. Thank you, John. Uh, in this uh, debate in, uh, between um, Nigel and Eliza Manning Buller, in which I, I tend to obviously agree more with Nigel, however, it does raise the question of the confusion over not only the, the nature of the enemy in this war, but also where the enemy is to be found. Um, as someone on the panel said, the uh, United States uh, result, preferred to resolve the legal ambiguities um, of the um, of ones that had got to track the, the enemy by killing him. Um, as m most of the terrorism to which we in Europe and I think the United States is exposed um, and obviously, I would exclude Pakistan, and, and uh, which is an entirely different, different issue. Is actually homegrown. That um, the terror acts to which people in Europe and in Britain have been subjected have been committed by European and British nationals. To what extent? can we respond in a way that would be identify this as a war as opposed to a crime? Many thanks. Well, we've had a tremendous uh, suite of interventions. Not uh, uh, each person of the panel has to answer all questions by any means. I think please take up the one or two in each case that were more clearly uh, address to you, just as an IISS editorial point before we conclude, um, we certainly agree that this intersection between international law and strategy, the way in which evolving international law affects strategic possibilities and the way in which strategic choices influence the shape of international law is uh, an, an area we have to work on much harder. We have. Uh, uh, recently taken on Sir Daniel Bethlehem, the former legal advisor of the FCO, and intend over the next six to eight months to build a robust international law and strategy program. So we hope at next year's Global Strategic Review to have a panel that will be addressing uh, these issues. Could I invite the speakers to uh, respond to the comments from the floor, group them as they like, in reverse order, Elliot Cohen, Nigel and I wouldn't uh, expect too much uh, high-level competence, not because of anything having to do with the individuals making these decisions, but because of the intrinsic difficulty of making them. And you know, I, mean, I, I guess I wrote a book on the subject, and I had a couple of years uh, seeing this. And what really strikes me is how hard it is to make good decisions. Uh, I surprisingly find myself agreeing with Patrick Seale that uh, it's very important to understand motives. But I, I would just qualify that in that I don't think the issue is simply politics. The problem is it's, it's the intersection of religion and politics. And that those are ways of thinking about the world that might have been uh, comfortable to Europeans in the 14th or 15th century, but not so much in the 21st. Uh, to the question about terrorism, I view this as warfare. That, that doesn't necessarily, I don't think viewing this as warfare, as asymmetric warfare, doesn't mean that one has to believe that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. You can still say, you know, they're dastardly terrorists. The point is they're doing it for an identifiable political or religio-political uh, purpose. And it doesn't, in other words, it doesn't imply moral equivalence. Calling something a war 
and, and this was one of the arguments against calling it war, is that you gave the other side uh, some kind of moral uh, benefit of the doubt, but I don't think the Allies were giving the Axis powers uh, the benefit of the doubt in the 1940s by saying we're at war with them. <clears throat> On cockroaches and scorpions, the problem with 9-11 is, is it showed that uh, given the nature of the modern world, a cockroach can become a scorpion. That's the real problem. That's the fundamental problem. And that, that was on the basis of simply a very high order of organizational skill. If you talk about the various kinds of biological technologies and others that are out there, I think there are other ways in which you can imagine the cockroach becoming a scorpion, and that's a huge dilemma for us. And then uh, Steve Flanagan made a wonderful point. The only thing I, I would say is, um, actually, um, I, I think that President Obama has taken us, oddly enough, in some respects, away from the soft power side to it. And what we've done is we've ramped up the kinetic side. We are killing more people. And um, I don't fundamentally have objections to killing most of the people that we're killing. In fact, I'm all in favor of it. But, but it is somewhat, pro it is problematic in a variety of ways when one of the main tools of American foreign policy or sort of, uh, particularly the conduct of this war, is sustained campaigns of assassination. And again, I speak as somebody who's not Swedish. Nice. Yeah, on the uh, risk of unconventional attacks, I think the inf perhaps the most interesting thing about uh, jihadist uh, terrorism is um, an almost autistic focus on a very narrow repertoire of operational techniques. And I'm not entirely certain, I don't think anybody really is certain why these groups have not uh, demonstrated uh, greater range. I mean, after all, if Al-Qaeda simply wanted to um, cause us uh, large-scale inconvenience and uh, sap our will, you know, they, you know, they could actually do it with one of these, and it doesn't need necessarily to be connected to something that goes back. Um, so I don't, I must confess, fully understand that. On the whole question of WMD, um, I think I definitely agree with Eliza Manning and Buller when she said that uh, we ill-advisedly gave our imaginations free reign in the aftermath of 9-11. I mean, the reality is that actually any act of terrorism is quite difficult to do. I mean, not, there's not to say that terrorists are particularly talented or clever people. They're not. Many of them are actually pretty dim. Um, um, but it is difficult to get yourself over that you know, barrier where you're actually going to go and commit any kind of terrorist act at all. And I think you know, it's just human nature when you get to that point to do what you can with the resources that are most likely to be um, immediately at your disposal. And CBRN is actually pretty hard. Uh, it really is quite hard. Um, so and I think that is, you know, th th that's the best ex 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 um, explanation I can offer. Um, on Fleur de Villa's question, I mean, I think, you know, um, I, don't th I don't think Liza and I are necessarily in disagreement on this. When it came to that, you know, uh, section of the populace that were the um, um, uh, font for homegrown terrorism, clearly the United Kingdom government could not declare war on a substantial segment of its population. People, you know, terrorists that arose from within the British community clearly had to be dealt with with due process and the law. The problem, of course, was that these people were in the main being directed by controlling minds who were beyond the reach of justice. And uh, that is where you know, things get a great deal more difficult. Um, and I think there is no answer. You know, again, the United States, uh, because it considers itself in a state of war with Al-Qaeda, um, feels itself perfectly justified undertaking uh, predator attacks against targets in the Pakistani tribal areas. In the case of the United Kingdom, that is permissible in Afghanistan because we are in a state of conflict, but not in Afghanistan because we do not consider ourselves technically in a state of war with Al-Qaeda. So we can't do that stuff. Um, on the question, on the legal point, I mean, I think you know, the issue really is that uh, when the uh, Geneva Conventions were, were drawn up, the possibility of uh, armed conflict between a state and a non-state group wasn't really thought about and, and as, as a likely contingency. Now, in international law, as I understand it, and as you know, Daniel, I'm not a lawyer. Um, some of my best friends are, but that's another story. 
um, that, that, that there's no intrinsic reason in international law why a state cannot be, if not at war, at least in a state of armed conflict with a non-state armed group. But what we don't have is a lot of definition on the detail of how you actually do that. And this is where, you know, this leaves us with some very difficult, anomalous circumstances, such as those who are faced with detainees in Afghanistan. We have a couple of remarks. On the WMD point, let's just remember that 10 years ago, we were still dealing with question marks over loose Soviet nukes. Uh, there was speculation that atomic demolition mines and things like that went, might have gone astray. I think by now we are fairly certain that was not the case. And uh, we know, look at the Iranians, that building nuclear weapons isn't done over day in a garage. It's a fairly, fairly, fairly extensive enterprise. On the legal issues, um, I could agree with everything that's been said, <laughs> although there have been different points of view. But the, the thing that troubles me as a policy practitioner, um, and we don't have too many detainees in Sweden, um, are the privacy issues. I mean, all of these things that have been described, what we do now in data mining and surveillance and television cameras and whatever, is a new world where privacy, integrity, the freedom of the individual has to be defined somewhat differently. And I'm not quite certain that we have found the right balance there as of yet. Clearly, we overacted in the beginning, that always the case, but have we found the right balance? I think we are struggling with that all the time. And I think that issue will, will, be, will be with us. On what we do in order to um, combat this, I agree with what it said, that there's always going to be religious fanatics or political fanatics. Always going to be people who are very dissatisfied with something. But the question is, what takes them over that threshold to start to kill other people indiscriminately? I, I remember when we went through the beginning, the 9-11, report and others, what did lead these people to go that, down that particular route? It was very often a local conflict. I remember it was a lot Chechnya, it was an element of Bosnia, it was somewhat less Palestine than we thought, but Palestine is starting to be there. So dealing with these particular local concerns is important also from the wider point of view. But then of course there are those that are going to be over that particular t tipping point anyhow, and they must of course be dealt with, but dealing with the issues around the world is of course important. Then, final point, we mentioned nation building and state building and things like that, and it's somewhat out of fashion nowadays, I've noticed. I would argue that is the number one thing we need to do. We can never get an orderly world if we don't have orderly states, because states by definition are territorial units that secure the law and order, and order of that particular piece of territory. If there are places in the world or territories where they're not functioning states, then we will be forced to send the drones or do whatever we do. But that's not a good thing. It is uh, uh, the world order, the Westphalian order to use that, is an order of orderly states. And accordingly, our efforts to help there to be orderly states around the world is perhaps long-term and good development of those is perhaps the best long-term prevention policies that we can do. Then we need the defensive policies as well, but the preventive policies should be the most important. Well, thank you very much. There was in the last uh, hour and a half, as there have been in the last 72 hours, tremendous uh, uh, food for thought there. I was gratified to hear Philip Stevens earlier say that his brain was full and his notebook was as well. And the last hour and a half has given us all the more to reflect on and think about how we as an institute uh, study this. So I would like you first to thank um, the three people who are speaking here, but in doing so perhaps all the people who have spoken and debated, including yourselves, at this Global Strategic Review. Thank you very much.